Good afternoon. This will be a hard act to follow. My name is uh, <laughs> Danny Kaufman. I'm from Brookings Institution. And uh, um, I've been put in, in a double difficult situation. One is that people who know me know that I'm, I'm not moderate at all, so I'm not <laughs> going to be the typical moderator. But we're going to have a session a little bit like the first one this morning, very different to what we just witnessed, which was great, but very different. <laughs> so we're going to have something very interactive um, among ourselves and all of, all of you, with very brief comments and, and to try to push the discussion forward. The second reason this is a difficult job is because we, we are ahead of the curve in terms of the nature of this panel, which is we just witnessed the launch of the OGP, and we are being asked about the lessons of evaluation. So here we have <laughs> an enormous <laughs> challenge that we are being asked questions, and the panelists, we are all great experts, will be in the difficult position of basically predicting the future. But nonetheless, there have been some lessons learned from similar programs, so I think we can have a useful uh, d a discussion. Let me very briefly, and not doing full justice, introduce the great panelists we have this afternoon. To my left is Yamini Ayer, Senior Research Fellow and Director of the Accountability Initiative at the Center for Policy Research in New Delhi, India. <coughs> and she has held a number of very interesting positions previously, including at the, at the World Bank, where I also used to be once upon the time. In fact, to her left is Sanjay Pradhan, <coughs> a very good friend and um, almost as important, the Vice President at the World Bank Institute. Um, he uh, has been pushing on working for transparency and openness at the World Bank and much more broadly for, for decades. And we, we share many experiences in that, uh, in that context, uh, including with the recently with the Open Data Initiative of the World, the World Bank. To Sanjay's left is Andrew McLaughlin, the executive director at Civic Commons, a, a US nonprofit helping governments build and share open technologies to improve public services, transparency, participation, and about five more objectives. That was which very moderate of you, by the way. I like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I like which that. You, you can give the immoderate <laughs> introduction, too, if you like. <laughs> yes, I'm sure you will add. Uh, I will add to that. You were the uh, Deputy Chief Technology Officer at the US government. I, I knew about you then and also at, at Google, so you must know the surrounding much better than some of us. And to Andrew's left is Ruth Levine, also a, a friend from the old days when you were at uh, CGD, currently the director of the Global Development and Population Program at the Hewlett Foundation, recently Deputy Assistant Administrator of USAID. So basically, as, as you can see, we have a great panel. I will start then with one pointer question to each of them. We'll start with, with Yamini and go around the table. Every uh, panelist will just have a few minutes for the initial uh, Q&A, &Q and then we'll start opening it. Uh, up. So the first question to Yamini is basically on, on impact and effectiveness. If we have learned already something related to some open government type of initiatives that have, have uh, been taking place, what do, do we know? What's the most salient issues that you would like to, to suggest to everybody that's important? And also what we don't know and we need to be mindful and, and learn about the effectiveness of the efforts of increasing government transparency, accountability, and citizen uh, engagement. And if we do have an example, please offer it. Sure, thanks, Danny. Um, I think before, before I sort of try and unpack this question of what we know and don't know, it's extremely important to make an analytical distinction between terms that very often we use in one breath, uh, transparency, citizen engagement, and accountability. Uh, the, oftentimes, I think, both in practice and in studying the effects of things, we tend to sort of assume that one leads to the other. And I, I think in some of what we saw uh, e e even, um, e even just now in terms of open government leads to accountable, efficient, effective uh, government. Um, and in actual practice, if you start unpacking what happens on the ground with experiments in transparency, citizen engagement, and accountability, which 
is a little more complicated, and I'll come to that in a minute. Th these relationships aren't implicit. Uh, they don't follow a linear progression. And we need to break these down to be able to understand how one leads to another, if it does at all. Um, and, I, and I'll try and explain this through some practical examples from my own experiences. Uh, we've been working on um, sort of using transparency of government budgets to try and mobilize citizens to participate in planning. The bulk of our work has been in elementary education. Education. Um, and and you, just to, to give you a live example, a few years ago we spent the better part of a year and a half working with a set of school management committees in, in, in villages in, uh, in rural Madhya Pradesh, a state in India. Um, and, and the first step was just to try and get the school management committees uh, aware of the fact that there were school management committee members, which in fact they didn't know. Uh, then we moved on to start talking about the school, about education, moved on to talking about the kinds of monies that come to schools and the kind of powers that these school management committees have to make plans um, and, and try to start mobilizing citizens to start, to start actually making the plans. When we got to the point where we sat down to make the plans, we realized that the money comes to these school management committees tied to such clear line item expenditures that knowing how much you can spend doesn't really give you the power to choose where you can spend it and as a result people lost motivation they stopped coming to meetings so the whole idea of you know using transparency of budgets to try and motivate and encourage citizens to mobilize participate in making a plan and scrutinize a school sort of failed right there and then which doesn't mean that transparency is not important in and of itself implicitly and intuitively is extremely critical. And by coming down to this point, we realized in our work that perhaps we need to take our advocacy back to the government to point out to the government from a very live example that in fact you need to unblock how you flow your money so that people actually have real control over that money to be able to make plans to mobilize and to start participating in, in that process. So citizen engagement needs more than transparency. Sometimes transparency may not lead to engagement, but may actually lead to a lot more, uh, lead to some amount of responsiveness. A partner organization that we work with, a group called Asar Center, tracks the quality of elementary education in schools in India. And it, and it, and every year it's come out with this rather shocking information that more than 50% of, of class five children that are passing out of elementary schools don't actually have the ability to read a standard two textbook. Something pretty basic, you'd assume that a child that leaves a elementary school would be able to read a standard two textbook. This information hasn't caused people to come out on the streets, but what it has done is that it's, 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 it's injected a conversation within government, within the media, that has started for us to talk about the need to think about quality of education and not just building infrastructure for schools. So you didn't have mobilization, but you had some sort of outcome which you could perhaps define as accountability. Um, on the other hand, Openness has also led to citizens coming out on the streets in India. It's led to unearthing large amounts of scams, as we've seen in the last few weeks. Somebody just talked about, Rakesh just talked about the fast against corruption. We had more, we had uh, millions of, uh, of middle class Indian citizens out on the streets, a mobilization that we've never seen before, all on account of transparency. So the, so the relationship between transparency and mobilization varies by context, um, and it has effects, uh, so, so, uh, and it has effects for of, of accountability that we uh, that, that sometimes we can't always predict because that relationship isn't linear, um, it isn't obvious, and we need to break these up to begin to understand these. I'll stop here, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about this as we go forward. In fact, we will pick this up. This is very important. Basically, you're saying transparency, openness is essential, is necessary, but it may not be sufficient uh, on on its own. The the first and in in some sense the second example you gave suggests that the problem is not only um, who you partner with, which is a crucial problem, but at what stage openness and transparency and engage, engagement takes place. Because like uh, in some cities in Brazil, if it happens at a very early stage before the decision making takes place, and it is with government, then you would have a much better chance than just exposed uh, disclosing information. So at what stage partnership takes place it's, it's, it's really important. That context, let's go to Sanjay now in terms of partnerships in this area, and perhaps because of what Yamini said, there are, there are two angles of partnerships here. A partnership in evaluating programs, and, and uh, since you are the vice president of WBI and you engage in so many partnerships, your insights would be very important. But uh, also in evaluating how crucial will be to figure out what type of partnerships 
in implementing these programs are crucial for them, what Yami said. So they know the, the importance of partnership, but just not any type of partnership will work, obviously, and I'm sure you have successes and failures as examples. Okay. Uh, thanks, Danny. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. In terms of uh, partnerships and evaluation, I think the first challenge, as you mentioned, is that uh, in terms of what, it, what partnerships exist for evaluations, the first challenge is indeed, this is such a new initiative we are launching it today. You don't see, and this is a relatively nascent area of open, first we have to get a common understanding of what it is, but it's a relatively nascent area. And so you don't see the same thriving, robust partnerships for evaluation in this area that you would see in other areas. That said, uh, there are institutions in this room here, uh, International Budget Project and Rakesh's NGO, I mean, they've been doing robust evaluations in specific areas. But overall, we don't see robust evaluations and partnerships for robust evaluations. Uh, since this uh, session focuses on evaluation, Danny, I wanted to just suggest that given the nature of open, um, uh, of open government, uh, I think it may be useful to sort of think about evaluation in this more live dynamic area in a little bit different way than you would think in much more stodgy, you know, sort of established areas. One is, I was struck by seeing, I think, Transparency and Accountability Initiative has done some of the best work in this area of emerging best practices. But if you look at the publication that's put out on the table, there are 18 best practices that are listed, uh, and they're very good ones, uh, and they're all submitted by civil society organizations. So typically, the partnerships for evaluation are with think tanks and so on. One implication is, well, however we evaluate it, the involvement of civil society organizations is going to be quite important. Second, because this is a live wire area, things are evolving and, and innovating, I think it's very important to do just-in-time evaluations, concurrent evaluations. In the World Bank Institute, one thing you asked, we are working closely with the Transparency and Accountability Initiative. Um, and we are trying to do rapid cycle evaluations of things that we are seeing unfolding in this conference as we speak. So as an example, we have worked with University of Nottingham to look at uh, just-in-time evaluation, rapid cycle evaluation of Kenya open data. Right? The third thing I would just say is that given that the knowledge base is not that robust in this area, you want to partner with experts and practitioners a lot more. And because there's a lot of live learning, I think the role for practitioner to practitioner exchange, rather than looking at established research in this area is very important. And later we can discuss it, but in the World Bank we are connecting practitioners who are leading the practice of open government. So for instance, Brazil does mobile participatory budgeting very well, we heard about that. We have connected it to DRC. Uh, and DRC has adapted that, so it's not based on research evaluation. Uh, similarly, we are providing a platform, we can discuss that later, you wanted to know examples, on open contracting in resource-rich countries. We are connecting seven countries to learn from each other live just in time, so peer learning. The last point I wanted to make, which gets into your issue of the nature of partnership as well, Danny, which is the following, that I think in the area of evaluation, one interesting angle in open government is that the citizens become the evaluators. And a very good platform, if you look at Huduma, which is uh, Ushahidi-inspired crowdsourcing, where citizens are providing evaluations of whether they got services, or checkmyschool.org in the Philippines, where s teachers and uh, where students and parents can give feedback on whether teachers are showing. That evaluation is built into it. I mean, that's what it's trying to do. So in a sense, rather than having an academic institution do the evaluation, the citizen feedback is itself doing the evaluation, which is also a very interesting dimension. This is great. Um, and we should not, because there's such an incentive these days to innovate and to appear to be innovator, we should uh, not underestimate the power of tools that have existed for quite a while, like some Paul scorecard. I mean, so there are, there are traditional tools who have been around to, 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 to do that. And just because they are part of something that has existed for two decades, uh, let's use it and build on, on, on that too, which are very complementary to what, what, what you have mentioned. But uh, the point that you raise is so important about these being a, a different type of challenge, which is very dynamic life, it's very broad, it's multidisciplinary too, which brings us then perfectly to, to Andrew. What is this animal? 
what are we talking about? What are we really talking about when we talk about open government? I mean, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a great word, but uh, I'm, I'm sure just like having worked on governance for the past two decades, there are 28 different definitions, and until today, nobody totally agrees. And if, uh, the, uh, the same risk we run. So, uh, of course, we don't have the time for uh, the full-fledged seminar that you could give us, but what are the two main competing definitions, you would say, which one would you prefer, and what are, is the implication of a preferred definition of what open government is, the implication of that for evaluation? So this is, um, it's almost as though I wrote this question for you, which I didn't. This is exactly the question I wanted to answer. So somehow or other, we're thinking alike today. Okay, so this gives me a chance to try to say something controversial. Um, so the whole initiative that we are here talking about today is misnamed. Um, and, uh, and what I mean by that, that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but what, what I mean by that is this. The real um, potential to change government uh, fundamentally, using the technologies that are changing uh, our day-to-day -day lives in very profound ways, is going to come because the governments embrace and accept it, and, uh, and that means that it has to play into their incentives. Government's incentives, especially at the local and city level, um, are largely to improve public services, to deliver public services in a better way. And I actually think that leading the discussion with openness and transparency, rather than leading the discussion with the improvement of public services by the smart use of technology is a mistake. Um, openness is an, an important value in and of itself. I agree totally with what Yamini said before, which is that there is no magical vector of causality that leads openness to produce better government. Openness can produce worse government. Technology can fuel corruption. Technology can facilitate the hiding of theft and all these different things. But um, one thing that, so my experience was when we came, when I, I came into the White House staff um, when President Obama was first elected on the transition and then in the White House, we launched an open government initiative. Beth Novick is here somewhere, led it in the White House. And we issued an open government directive. Two years later, the White House, together with Brazil and the other partner countries, launched the Open Government Partnership. What I think I learned in those two years in between is that government incentives to embrace technology for the sake of transparency do not really exist. And much of the open government work inside the US government was an enforcement matter. Like the president said, here's the rule, and then we had to go pound the agencies to try to get them to do it. Much more powerful, much more vibrant, much more um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, influential is deploying technology uh, to solve government problems. In other words, how do you deliver better services so that you look better while spending less money? And it's that nexus to me that open government's real potential, uh, it's at that nexus that open government's real potential lies. Great. Of course, um, a key question, and eventually we want the audience involved, is whether what you just said is more amenable to the current challenges in more industrialized and mature democracies. What about countries which are not fully there, the Egypt a few months ago and now, uh, where people don't just want to consume and have access to the typical public services, but they are demanding transparency, access to information, and full openness as a right in a much broader sense. Um, so, so there is also a question of, of tailoring the, the objective to the setting one is, is talking about. What That's you just said resonates a lot perhaps right. with the typical US and maybe European citizen, but coming also from, from an right. emerging economy, there are challenges much beyond the very technocratic provision of public That's services. Right. So you, you're absolutely correct that there are places where the stars are in alignment so that the public demand for transparency coincides with a political moment and a political movement and the will to pursue transparency for its own sake. It does happen sometimes. Um, and, and it's quite appropriate to think about it that way. The way I think about it though is that in most of the world where most of the human population lives, um, uh, you have administrative structures like cities and political leadership like mayors who are actually on the hook to deliver better public services. Uh, in democratic societies, maybe they get defeated if they don't. In non-democratic societies, maybe they don't get promoted if they don't. And there's all kinds of 
you know, uh, uh, zones in between. But I think what you say is absolutely right. I, I hate overgeneralizing to say open government should be this or that, or government should always pursue public services instead of other things. But I will just simply say that in many cases, not only in rich countries, uh, in, in, in many of the cities the World Bank is doing e-government initiatives right now, for example, the delivery of public services is the imperative. It's how you make citizens' lives better, and openness and transparency won't necessarily flow from it, but can be made to flow from the digitization of public services. Well, we'll move to Ruth, but perhaps broadening your definition of what the public service is, I may find convergence with what you Policy say. Policymaking is a public service, well, for example. And also a diminishing corruption. If, if we're in that venue, then it becomes a much broader uh, and broader objective uh, uh, as well, which raises a question at the end of the day, how, how does one evaluate this all? Does one go more for, for the inputs of how important is then to look for the final results and impact? And it would impact then be then very focused on public services in the narrow technocratic sense or also more broadly? But basically what, and you have been so involved in this, those issues of evaluation, what in the context of this very different and enormous challenge, which is open government or, or rename the way you would suggest, uh, would imply in terms of how to go about the best way in terms of evaluation? Well, um, first of all, I think, you know, you started by um, saying that it was a little bit paradoxical or difficult to, at the beginning of a, an initiative, be talking about evaluation. But of course, that's exactly when one should be talking about evaluation, because it's a, a moment when uh, there's an opportunity to sort of clarify for what are we doing this. And I think at the highest level, a lot of the OpenGov um, work is motivated by a belief and a value system. But then the sort of questions about, well, how to make that data yield the greatest impact, greatest improvement in people's lives becomes a, a sort of object of, of, in fact, more formal study and evaluation to figure out what are the strategies that work best to make data that's made available because it's it's uh, because the governments have embraced the value of open government how to make that data most available, most relevant to people who then can be stimulated to, to use it to hold governments accountable, the exact sort of notional line of causation. So there are evaluations that can be done of those mechanisms, comparing and contrasting what works best to, to get to particular service delivery or other um, benefits. And so let me just suggest a, a couple of things to keep in mind when we're thinking about sort of how, how to confront the evaluation challenge. Certainly there's the real-time learning about the feasibility of different strategies, but when you're really looking at impact, it's a, it's a more formal process, I think. Um, and I think you have to consider how, um, how you can generate strong enough, compelling and convincing enough evidence to change minds, either your own mind about what works or somebody else's. And I think often we think of evaluation instead as um, a way to marshal a lot of evidence in favor of our case, which isn't actually real evaluation. Um, so instead we have to think, so what would I have to, what, what could I observe uh, about the uh, effectiveness of the um, transparency initiative that I'm working on or that, uh, that I'm observing that would convince me that it's not working? That's a much more challenging question, but in fact that's a, a central piece of evaluation. Um, just a couple more points. Um, I think certainly focusing on the, the outcomes and the, the effect on, for example, service delivery outcomes instead of things like how many people were reached or how many web hits were there, there's a real temptation to mistake volume, in my view, mistake volume of engagement with the effectiveness of engagement. 
And then final point here is um, that I think we have to really be careful about observing and measuring uh, unintended consequences to make sure that the, the efforts don't just sort of reinforce the hierarchy of people who have access to information, who are literate, who have access to and use technology, either gender differentials or uh, income or literacy uh, differentials. Um, I think we have to pay attention to whether there are um, uh, security uh, issues that come about when people use information to hold governments to account, whether they're then punished for it in one way or another, um, and whether there's a backlash when, it, when information is exposed about how poor the quality of services are, uh, to look at whether people then just withdraw, take their kids out of school, uh, stop using the public facilities um, as a kind of unintended consequence. The, that's a great point, the unintended consequence. How about the flip side of that, which is the, the key missing link, because we are all prisoners of our own expertise, our own fields, our own professional past. Uh, and if we're economists, we look at it one way, and in the World Bank, and if we're lawyers, each initiative takes a life of its own that sometimes is very narrow, and this is the open, openness initiative. But sometimes in real life, in the social sciences, if two or three key in ingredients are not there together, which may cross across policy fields, for instance, Mexico, fantastic innovation. We see it here, and uh, we heard it earlier. And we know about the, the Freedom of Information Act and the enormous progress has been. They have not made similar progress in terms of rule of law and there are issues of impunity and corruption. So if those, th those things don't go hand in hand in many in initiatives, are you going to the, get the goods delivered? Which is a very important, in my view, issue also for evaluation. What complementary measure, which may not be the responsibility of that particular initiative or project, but if the evaluators are not going to look at the forest and not just a particular tree of, of, of that, we may continue doing and putting funds on one area, and there are two or three complementary areas that are not making the progress, and without those interaction and linkages, it doesn't work. So um, if, if, I don't know if you have a, any comment on that to, oh, to follow up, but that's an issue. I know that Yamini has a follow-up comment to, to a previous it's issue. I, I actually want to take the point, Andrew, you made um, a little further, which is, I, I think when we, th when we talk about transparency, citizen engagement, accountability, altogether or separately. Uh, one of the questions we need to be asking ourselves is, um, are we thinking of these as uh, public goods in and of themselves, which are essential characteristics of governance of democracy, or are we talking of these as conduits to arrive at effective public services? And you can have effective public services without any of these things, and you could potentially have all of these things and have very ineffective public services. So I think we need to unpack this a little bit in our minds. And, and technology brings this whole thing um, and throws up, I think, a whole set of new questions. I've noticed in India, um, where in fact, India's entire growth story is sort of premised on technology, and, and government loves to use technology um, as a way of sort of demonstrating how we're sort of progressing from being a poor nation to a potential superpower. And you talk to any government official who will resist any kind of push for accountability uh, and, and reform, but will be very excited to use technological innovation and bringing it into the system. So, I mean, you know, you'll have officers that now have mobile phones with GPRS technology, so someone somewhere can monitor whether they actually go to the villages to monitor programs. Uh, and, and I think we take it to a level of complete extremity. That's not how you, you reform government. That's not how you have good government. You, you know, government also means that you have to have trust within a system and that the system should function effectively. So I think in, in thinking about open government, in thinking about transparency, accountability, at public services, we need to sort of go back a little bit to say what are the goals, where are we starting from, and then start thinking about what we're trying to evaluate and, and how we want to assess impact. Perhaps Andrew may follow up to this before, be, without being offended by the <laughs> suggestion that, that IT at the end of the day is a tool and an incredibly important and cool tool, but if one doesn't move beyond that, 
Uh, you yeah. and that's yeah. what you're saying. You may not, you may not get the, the goods delivered. Yeah, but if so you can complement that by giving an example in your own previous jobs or current jobs of of success and a failure in in the IT, because not everything works out, and and why? Yeah. So. Um, so when I give talks these days, there's this great slide that I like to show, which is taken from a rail car in China. And what you see is uh, the Chinese characters for uh, restaurant, and then the English characters next to it that say, translate server error, which they printed <laughs> on a big poster. So like, of course, like blind use of technology is a very bad idea. Um, you still have to know uh, language, right, in order to use a translation tool. Anyway, so let, let, me, let me say this. So. Um, Technology is a tool, it's not an end. We know that, we say it often. I, I'm not sure that we, 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 we believe it all the time. But um, what I wanna say, I guess, is this. Um, I believe, just from experience, that the best um, uh, advances and reforms in the way that government operates as, a, as an expression of democratic uh, pro process as a deliverer of public services, as a um, manager and regulator of human activities, maker of policies and these kinds of things, in all of these different areas, um, you move forward when you get the right alignment of interests. And technology can't magically make a ruler change how he, she perceives her interests to be. And so um, at the moment, what I really like is kind of, um, uh, opportunistic advances in government in various and sundry parts of the world that take advantage of the, the alignment of interests. And so for, for those of us that are kind of like activists or technologists, part of the art of this work right now is figuring out where those alignment of interests are. So I want to find government agencies that can be made to look good, right, can be made to feel better about themselves and the work that they do and be more excited going into the office because they're using technology in some exciting way uh, that is, you know, cheaper, faster, better, but, you know, it actually makes their lives better. And there are many other approaches, like you can get, um, you know, like a Mike Bloomberg in New York who will kind of like drill technology down into the organization from the top. You can find other places. Um, I just spent a week in Buenos Aires where they've got uh, like a real like hacker crowd inside the city government, like fantastically talented technical people who are driving really interesting changes with the political backing from above, but a political backing that doesn't really know what they're doing at the details. They just know that exciting things are happening. You can have bottom up kind of changes too. So um, I don't know, Daniel, I, I could tell, tell lots of examples, but why don't we but, keep the conversation yeah, no, going it, and all But in, in essence, you are saying, and the Buenos Aires example is very good, that the technology coupled with the innovation and decision by some to publicize some information, and it has to be marketed, and outreach happens in a very proactive way, is changing the equation, the cost-benefit analysis calculation of the politicians, of what's in, in their interest. OpenSecrets.org, uh, the, the, basically the organization that publishes all the information of which, which senators, members of Congress benefit from what type of campaign contributions. It's not fully there in terms of the major changes that ha have to happen in political finance, but those type of things alter the equation and the calculation. So that, that can be very effective in that sense. We'll come back to the panel, but let's open it up. What I will ask you is first to introduce your, yourself and where you, you come from, and also in line of the nature of this, to please be very brief, whether a comment or a question, and no five questions in one. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Okay. Go ahead. The floor is yours. You want? Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Yanori Makamba. I'm from Tanzania. I'm a member of parliament. Uh, I want to go back to um, the last question of the earlier panel, uh, which was relevance of all this uh, in the daily life of uh, people who are struggling to get by. I represent uh, 200,000 people, very rural, mountainous constituency of Tanzania, 200 kilometers from the Indian Ocean. Uh, uh, distance to the nearest uh, health center is 23 kilometers, zero internet access, 14% uh, uh, telephone uh, network uh, penetration. And uh, for them uh, to get by every day is a struggle. 
And uh, I want us to link these high ideals uh, that we are talking about here with uh, impact on these uh, daily lives. We may be talking about data, portal, access, but just for us here to access and uh, consume and analyze and, and, and uh, evaluate. Uh, but what does this mean to uh, this regular, uh, typical 30-year-old um, young woman with uh, three kids? Uh, and, and finally, I think that uh, this is a comment. Uh, it is important uh, that this dialogue eventually leads to a culture of accountability because access to data it is in itself uh, should not be an end in itself. Uh, that what happens then? Um, I mean, if in Tanzania somebody looks at it and says, oh, this is really bad, and nothing happens, then it's really uh, not important. Thank you. Ruth. Yeah, maybe I could just start. I'm, I'm sure others have a response a, as well. I think we sort of have this tendency to conflate the uh, technological piece of this with the core, which is access to relevant information. And so building on, on the example that, or the setting that, that you described, last week in Dar es Salaam, there was the launch of the OASO a uh, report on the quality of, pri of primary of, of basic education. You were there. Um, and so that information about where there is a gap between how much kids should be learning and how much they are learning, combined with information about where the teachers should be and how many hours a day they should be in the classroom, perhaps combined with information about how much the government is able to provide and donors are able to provide to different districts um, in terms of non-salary resources. That information made available at the local level can certainly inform and, and potentially induce mothers and fathers and citizens to uh, ask the right questions of their local um, local officials. Now, how they get that information has to be appropriate to the to the the information resources that they have they have access to. So, in this case, it's not going to be through you know information on a website, but rather through district level meetings and more community level communications. Your comment was so important that everybody wants to provide feedback. So, we'll go. Sanjay. <laughs> So uh, I don't know that much about that particular community, but I wanted to just give a couple of quick examples of how open government and the way we are talking about can actually make a difference in the lives of, of people. So let me take an example from DRC. Um, in, in a very poor part of DRC, South Kivu, in the eastern part, uh, as I understand it. So DRC was uh, decentralizing, but there wasn't enough trust that local citizens had that the decentralization of resources would do them any good. So the question was, how could you engender a process by which the ordinary citizens would have a say and they would get some benefits for the money that was in local communities? And this was a case where we facilitated a knowledge exchange with Brazil, in fact, the case that we heard about at lunchtime, where mobile budgeting gave citizens a, a voice so SMSs were sent where, uh, uh, where uh, people came to local town halls, and they were able to provide feedback on where they wanted. Through SMS, they could vote and provide feedback on where they wanted the resources to go. What's very nice about this story is the way it ended up is that not only was there a shift in the composition of local budgets, that local citizens wanted more money in school repairs and road repairs, and so they saw actual uh, benefit there. But actually, it led to an increase in revenues as trust in government expand, increased. Same example with checkmyschool.org, example of, of the Philippines, where teachers were not showing up to school, teachers were, uh, textbooks were not showing up. And there was a mechanism by which uh, parents could give feedback. And those that didn't have internet access, uh, civil society organizations could work with them to again use SMS feedback, which is after all applicable. So there, there are several other examples I could give of mechanisms by which government has reached out 
become open and transparent, citizens have become engaged through certain platform, including mobile platforms and other such platforms, and it's actually led to better delivery of services locally. Of course, the, the, there is a, a question there, because you, you mentioned with very concise data the problem of, of internet penetration and so on. Now, you mentioned, and that's very good news probably, 14% telephone penetration, that's probably mobile, and given the extent to which they are shared, which I know from my friendship with Mo Ibrahim, um, that means that in every little village and so on, there's probably a way of providing some information through, through, through SMS, but I may be mistaken. But also, let's not underestimate what, what you are doing and you can do in terms of the outreach and providing that information. But I know that you have a comment. No, just yeah. a very short one, which is, to, to me, this is a great example of where um, the answer to your question is clearly not government agencies putting data sets up on the web, at least not directly. That is not going to persuade any of your constituents that you're making, if, if this was, say, your initiative, that you're making a big difference in their lives. But we've all up here could give you lots of examples where you, you, you look at the technology picture that exists and you find a configuration of services, outreach, um, approaches that take advantage of SMS text messaging to send daily reminders to patients to take their pills, to pregnant women to um, uh, uh, update them on the development status uh, of their um, uh, baby and, um, and so forth. There, there are lots of great examples of how you can use technology, not as an end in itself, but you know, to, to, to do something meaningful that uh, because it creates data flows, and this is just the one other thing that I wanted to say. I, I just wanted to go back to what Sanjay said. The reason to use digital stuff um, is because inherently it's more trackable than non-digital stuff. Paper is hard to track, bits are easy to track. And when you track, you build a substrate of data that allows you to manage for performance. You can manage for performance of the government, you can manage for efficient use of resources, you can much more effectively, though not in any way in a foolproof sense, investigate uh, and look for corruption and, and, and the disappearance of money and so forth. So there is a reason to do it and to use those tools and my hypothesis is that if you do it smartly, you actually should spend less money than we were used to spending in the past. Good, but we shouldn't forget community radio. E exactly what I wanted to say, that, uh, that, that sometimes we forget uh, that before all this technology came about, people still communicated. And what we need to what? be doing is to take the websites and find different ways of sharing it with people. Uh, you know, e even just a village play or someone with a gramophone walking around giving out information is a way of spreading, uh, sp is a way of spreading the news and dealing with the fact that large parts of the world don't have internet and don't have mobile phones. So I, I think we shouldn't forget that. We do sometimes. Where all this leads to? Claire Shore. Thank you. I'm the chair of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative that's trying um, in some of the countries with it, rich natural resources but often poor governance and lots of poverty and so on to use transparency to get better accountability. And so with great difficulty, the figures are collected from the companies, of what they pay to the government, what the government receives, and then the, they're reconciled and published. And it's all based on the absolute assumption that if we do that, and it sounds simple, but in lots of places it's really hard work to get these figures out and published, and they've never been published before, that it will lead to more accountability. But our latest evaluation said, what's your theory of change? How do you know? I mean, as you're all talking about evaluation, I mean, this is a very important question, but I believe that it will, but I'd just like your comments on how we know or whether we ought to be doing something to measure, and if so, how would you go about it? Uh, while you think, because Ruth, you want to say something, and Sanjay, while you think about it, let's not underestimate, in spite of the obvious challenge that the same day that OGP is officially launched, we're being asked all these tough questions about how to evaluate. Let's not underestimate that there are particular areas of open government that have been around for a long time and have been evaluated very much in depth. One of them is e-government. And there are OECD, World Bank, and other evaluations. And one learns lessons from that perspective in terms of what works and what doesn't, including about the issue of of real participation, bottom-up approach, approaches in terms of adaptation to the local reality and, and, and so on. I, I don't want to, to go over, but let's, let's not underestimate that, they, that we sh 
the, the power of looking at areas that have been around. They're, others are not going to be the same areas, and they'll have other evaluation challenges, and they should be adapted. But there are some lessons already from those, and there's some of this theory of change type of answers could come from looking in depth to those research studies. There are very good researchers, about two or three major papers, I would say, no more. But let's not underestimate and not look at those because they are important to learn lessons, which goes very much to what you have been doing before. Sanjay. Uh, Claire, I just wanted to share with you on the specific example of resource-rich countries and extractives, an example of how we are approaching it and then getting into what the theory of change is. So uh, we carried out, we've been involved, obviously, as key partners on EITI. We carried out consultations in resource-rich countries in Africa and seven countries. And the question that the consultations revealed is that the problem they felt, the, the citizens felt, was less on the revenue side and more on the contract side. Mm -hmm. So it was an upstream contract. That's where the corrupt deals are made. And so the consultations revealed that what they needed in the spirit of open government, they needed open contracting. So they wanted the terms of the contract upstream to be available and understood by the citizens. Now, you could have an open, gov open contracting thing revealed on the web. But what our consultations in terms of the theory of change very quickly revealed is that the people who are supposed to benefit from those contracts, for instance, what the private sector was supposed to give to the local communities, had no idea what was in the contract. They had no capacity to understand it. And even the auditor generals who are supposed to audit these didn't know. So two things we did in terms of, and it, it has yielded, it, these are early days, but we convened uh, multi-stakeholder coalitions in seven countries, including Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, looking at open contracting, you know, of, of the big contracts that were coming up. And we pulled in um, uh, government, private sector, civil society, but also parliaments, uh, auditor generals, and so on. Um, and one of the things that revealed in Liberia, for instance, that the, uh, the local communities really, uh, they were supposed to benefit a lot, but they had no idea, so this was never implemented. So we worked with the private sector in very simple ways to not only have the contracts be open in the spirit of open contracting, but build the capacity of local communities to understand what's in the contract. And the private sector partners in this initiative actually helped translate the contracts into the local language and we did an, a simple learning exercise, a training exercise for local communities. And it actually led them to demand certain benefits that they wouldn't have otherwise. And a quick example from Ghana in that case was the Auditor General for the first time understood that there were things within his domain. And now there are two big contracts that in Ghana that are part of, that have been introduced for an audit that would not have been done before. This is early days. But it actually tells me that there is a lot of scope for having first multiple stakeholders come together in a shared platform. And one of the things we found which was very helpful was peer-to-peer -peer learning, this whole area of South-South exchanges. And that actually can, can inspire change more than donors or the World Bank saying what the change should be. So I find this, this area so vexing, really. I mean, because um, we've heard about the you know, land ownership records, transparency can lead to the exploitation of people who don't know how to value those rights, for example. And one of the great examples that gets talked about a lot, um, I'm not enough of an economist to know if it's uh, causation or just correlation uh, here, but is the example that in the 1970s there was concern about CEO pay in publicly traded companies in the US. The Securities and Exchange Commission required that companies, publicly traded companies, publish the compensation packages for their top executives. And what happened was, instead of shareholders being able to uh, reduce CEO pay, it led to a massive explosion in CEO pay where you know, CEOs used the transparency because the institutional mechanisms to vindicate the interests of shareholders were weak. So in the extractive industries case, as I listen to it, I keep thinking like the theory of change has to be connected to institutional reform, rule of law, and all the things we usually talk about that are so painful and difficult because transparency in and of itself really, um, without understanding more about the incentives and all that other stuff, I wouldn't even make a conclusion, but it anyway, really could have negative perverse effects of the kinds that we've talked about. And I think that theory of change has to be deeply rooted in institutional reform in the kind of work that you're doing. 
Norway, yeah. you know, Norway's extractive industries and transparency there is fundamentally different from, uh, you know, a, a transparency program and what it might do in Congo, let's yeah. say. Yeah, and economies would, I mean, this is a very important example, but economists would engage you in the whole issue of the economics of superstars. Mm -hmm. And that, and, and, and that's a different niche market. And what happens in, in sports and with Luciano Pavarotti and their pay, the more transparency you have, the more competition you could have. It's like monopolistic auctions. But uh, that relates also to the issue of, uh, that Sanjay brought up, uh, the upstream review of, of contracts is so crucial and it's been a neglected area, not because somebody forgot, because that was the incentive. If you have very late transparency, it doesn't help you too much, and that's what we discussed before. I would only add to your point of multi-stakeholder, which is crucial, is the early review by the top world expertise, not in terms of this contract, not taking the side of the multinational, but helping from the side of the, of the government. But even before, or at the same time that the communities get involved, it's quite often that the governments at that early stage don't have the expertise, and very quickly some contract is reached at very detrimental, not just to the community, but the government. And we saw that in, in Ghana there was an incentive structure conspiring against having an early review of the, of the oil and mineral contracts. There were some exceptions of multinationals that said, that, no, that's not good enough, we should be more transparent, but it's it's absolutely a um, cru crucial issue. I saw, well, Karen, great. No, you got it behind you. Amazing typist can't type, is that right? Don't write that. <laughs> um, I, I, my background, I'm, I'm Karen Christensen from Publish What You Fund. My background is really in, in evaluating or contributing to evaluations of things like poverty reduction strategies and these big national plans and financial management system rollouts like NTEFs and that kind of thing. So unsurprisingly, I think the logic theory based, theory of change um, type approaches to evaluation in this sector are really important. We have to have a hypothesis that we're then testing. I think randomized control trials have their place, but they're, they're limited in their effectiveness in this kind of public policy area. But I do think, and there's two things that partly Claire's um, intervention came to mind, is I think we, we often massively oversell in this sector. Um, we claim that... Like, like in any sector. Well, and I don't know that, right? My sector is, is limited in my experience, so it would be great to know whether that is. I think international development does it slightly more from experience. I look at the British news or the American news. We tend to... And I think there is a real issue around how do we evaluate things where we know it's necessary but not sufficient. I think you know, that came up very strongly from a lot of the things you guys have been saying, is that transparency is not going to result in reduced corruption. It's not going to result in better governance. A, transparency is certainly not going to result in more effective aid. But just try doing it without it. That's the issue. And how do we construct sensible, thoughtful, evaluative frameworks that actually help answer that question? Um, I know there will be answers, but you know, even I, I say this with, with, my, with some of my donors in the room, that how does something like an advocacy outfit doing this yeah. try to articulate something sensible around impact yeah, I mean, that isn't just inputs? No, I, you, you bring up a really important point, and it's something that we struggle with a lot, with all the time. I think there is a need for a lot more thought on methodologies for, for measuring effectiveness and impact in this kind of work, for precisely this, the kind of reasons that you bring up. Um, I, randomized control trials are one way, and, and I fear that uh, we, we sort of, very often we think that that's the only way, or at least in India it's sort of becoming quite often the, often, often the only way. Um, and what's missing in all of this is, 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 some, is, is much more detailed, analytical, almost anthropological case studies of how government reacts and responds. And sometimes these reactions and responses are very different to how you would imagine. I mean, I've noticed in the last three months, because in India now suddenly everyone's talking about corruption and, um, and accountability in the same breath, that I've been getting telephone calls from various 
various people in government asking me, you know, how do we become socially accountable? It's sort of the, the, the bureaucratic question that, that, that I get often. And, and then we have these very bizarre meetings where I'm asked, you know, give us some guidelines so that we can put them in our program so that we can, we, so that we become more socially accountable or we become more accountable. Because bureaucracy is reinterpreting for itself the idea of accountability as a guideline driven methodology of, of, of achieving something. That's how bureaucrats think. And, you know, if, if only someone would try and do an anthropology of the bureaucracy, we'd really see where all these advocacy efforts for transparency and accountability are leading us to. Because I think actually th there's a very interesting moment here. What, the minute you have a word that becomes part of government vocabulary, you have an opportunity that you can leverage in very many different ways. You need to understand that to be able to have some sort of effect. Um, and th this kind of thing will not get captured in, quantify, in, in quantitative work. So we need a mix of both. You need numbers, you need empirical data, you need randomized control trials and other such ways of evaluating. But you also need to be thinking of qualitative, analytical, anthropological, ethnographic, case study work that really tells you how the bureaucracy and how the, po how, how the politics of accountability and transparency is translating in government. What, what, what a challenge. <laughs> and in fact... I'm not going to have to do it, so I can just ask. <laughs> no, this is very important. Um, because the flip side of the cautionary tales that have come out from this table that it's, it's necessary but not sufficient, the flip side is, is still to say this is incredibly important. So nobody should be even thinking about throwing the baby out of the bathwater. But what kind of transparency and when does it work more effectively and when it doesn't is the question we're asking. And let's not minimize in the context of what you're saying that transparency can be a game changer in terms of a process. And that's not quantifiable easily, A, and le le let alone with randomized controlled trials. And the best example is the Arab Spring. And what all of the sudden, the catalytic impact that just having some tools and trans transparency around them, which had nothing to do with the government, to the contrary, could, could have. And sometimes we don't, don't consider that in theories of change and so on, because some of these tools that uh, we usually use, especially as economists, are quite static. But there are tipping points which sometimes are spurred and spurhead, and I'm sure you have many examples of when, when uh, uh, these uh, took place. There are members here from, from, from Chile, and I know what uh, Voto Transparente is doing, and, 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 and so on. We heard from Mexico. How do we use and integrate into evalu evaluation um, the unintended consequences which can be very powerful and positive to and creates a further demand for change and so on. It's, it's, it's a question. I saw a, a hand for a follow-up uh, question. Oh, yes, now they're in the back. Um, thank you. My name is Teresa Pardo. I'm the director of the Center for Technology and Government at the Univ University at Albany here in New York. Um, I have two questions, actually, but um, I, was ver I wanted to weigh in on the public value proposition um, work. I'm very excited to hear about that. It's a place we do a lot of work, but I, I, I'm going to jump to the question that I have, which has to do with the next generation public administrator. Um, I, in one of the other hats that I wear at the university as a, is as a founding member of our information strategy and management concentration in our public administration and policy program. And this is a program that's ranked second in the nation that's trying to do exactly what I think folks here are talking about, which is to create the next generation public manager. There's lots of folks in the room who are leaders uh, from a political or societal perspective, but we have many folks um, from around the world at UAlbany, and I'm sure other universities um, are, are experiencing this as well. I have students from Indonesia, from Mexico, from Colombia, from Taiwan, from Korea, who are studying these questions. How do we change the game, um, and how can we change our ac academic programs back in these countries when my doctoral students go back and teach undergraduate and graduate students? So what I wanted to hear from the panel is maybe some quick insights about how can the academic program that we're delivering um, to students around the world, students who will have a passion for public service. What can we add into those curricular um, resources to make a difference going forward? Great. I'm getting nods that the time is about to run out, so what I will do is let each of you both address the comment and question if you wish, but otherwise also to add quickly um, any concluding comment or issue you would want to bring out from the panel. You, now we will go in the reverse order than the initial. Yeah. 
Uh, maybe I'll just take the opportunity to, to respond to, to your question as, as well as I, as I can. It was just too wide-ranging a conversation, I think, to have other concluding uh, remarks. Um, you know, I, I, I do think that the, this is probably an obvious point, but the study of particular successful and then unsuccessful uh, cases uh, put within a theoretical construct or a, a theory of change, some articulation of, you know, what what is the kind of line of causation that is separate from some completely disruptive, unanticipatable um, set of events? What what is the sort of steps that we think are happening, and how do certain cases illustrate that they do happen that way or that they don't? Um, and then I just encourage you to make your curriculum resources as open as possible so that they can be used outside of your own university. Mm. So, um, you know, so three, three thoughts. First, um, public managers should expect that their work life is as awesome as their online life uh, at home. And that's one of the big things for government is that government needs to take advantage of these um, declining cost, ever faster computing power, ever faster broadband, which is going to define our adult lives, you know, mine from this point forward. Second point, um, what I really want from public managers in the next generation is uh, facility and indeed an expectation of data. Facility with and an expectation of data. Data, 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 data. So you can't run Amazon uh, unless you are constantly gathering all the conceivable data on your system and optimizing your operations against it. Government is no different. And we should expect that when government is engaging in activities for public service, for policy making, for public engagement, they are uh, generating data dashboarding it, mapping it, visualizing it, analyzing it, and managing against it, just like you would in any other organization. And it's possible now because these tools have gotten so cheap and so easy. This is not out of the reach of governments, even poor governments. Even the governments at the bottom of the income scale can get really great capabilities to gather and analyze data for, very, for free. And so my concluding point, just is to, I really want to say how exciting it is to hear Sanjay say that real-time data is a part of what a major funder expects governments to be doing these days because um, it is absolutely within reach and should be a fundamental component. It's not, it doesn't replace systematic periodic evaluation, but it is a very, very powerful way uh, to modulate and iterate on the work that we're doing um, in real time. That's very good. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, I just had two, uh, two suggestions on your points on the new public manager. One is that the paradigm of public administration has clearly changed, uh, and that's an obvious point. But I think the frontier going forward is not of a unilateral dispensation of authority, but it's collaborative governance. And it's collaboration, and a lot of good results we see is when there's collaboration. That's what open government partnership represents. But we are seeing that the frontiers are where government cooperates with citizens, with civil society, private sector. So that's one point. But the second is a more old-fashioned view, which is I think uh, the, the, the next generation of public administrations need to reintroduce the notion of public service. Uh, in many countries around the world, people have gotten used to take rather than give. And, and I think that notion of ethics and public service and I'll just tell you one very quick example in, in a major anti in a T with TI, we organized an international anti-corruption conference in Seoul, and the head of a major global NGO gave an example that there was a major earthquake in the state of Gujarat in India, and his organization was doing rehabilitation in that village. They came across this poor woman who had lost her whole family and all her belongings in this earthquake, and she was sitting there crying and looking at the ruins of whatever little she had, and as they went through the rehabilitation, she approached them with a 100 rupee note, which is $2, and said, take this. This is for the good work that you're doing. And they said, we cannot take this from you. You have probably $10 left, and you're giving us $2. And she said, no, this is my duty. This is my duty to give. That was the duty of public service. And in countries around the world, people have gotten used to take rather than give. And I think that old-fashioned sense of ethics of public service irrespective of technology, irrespective of open governance, needs to be reinculcated back into public administration. 
Thanks. Um, in, in our work in, uh, at the Accountability Initiative, we're actually trying to, uh, tr trying, to, trying to create a new generation of public managers uh, in, in a, a, a through what started out really just as a capacity building course for our grassroots activists. Uh, it evolved into a, a far more far-reaching and I think much more ambitious project to try and create a sort of cadre of what I call, what we call amongst ourselves fiscal detectives, people who um, are able to understand the importance of collecting and gathering evidence, using that evidence um, at the front line to be change agents, to try and push, uh, uh, to, to try and push for government to function in a different way. Um, and if you ask me, uh, how I would measure impact for the work that I do, I think the impact of the work I do would be to be able to create a, a sort of network of people who are public managers who think differently um, over a period of time. And if I'm able to do that, I think I could go to bed happy and, and, and think I've done a job. <laughs> it may never happen, but, but I think that's real impact. That's where we'll actually see change, and that's where we'll see effects of transparency, uh, citizen engagement, and real accountability. Great. Let me uh, end by perhaps just putting, uh, obviously, my own bias summary in three bullets uh, <laughs> for, from the last part of the discussion, but I think it reflects the very rich interaction with all of you and may still uh, help in terms of your question. Three, um, three points. One, demand side. The demand side of open government is crucial. This is not just about supplying basically the supplying institutions of the government, but this is about the interface with citizens, civil society, and the bottom-up and the multi-stakeholder uh, uh, approach. And that's what I think uh, uh, Sanjay was talking about, a major evolution in terms of the tr from the traditional public sector management as to, to what we view today. It's basically, that's why we talk generally about governance more broadly and not just about those. Second, the the famous precept number six it was in, in the movie about McNamara, get the data. Um, and get, get the data not in the mindless fashion and not always quantitative, so to say. It can, digitizing, fine, but uh, let's not underestimate, that's what you're saying, the qualitative aspect. But getting the data is, is absolutely crucial and in real time, and that came out very, very clearly. And Third, last but not least, in spite of all the caveats and the issues that have been brought up and to the comfort of Karen, at the end of the day, sunlight is still the best disinfectant. <laughs> so many thanks to the great panelists and to, to the great audience. I think it's, it's time to, to conclude and move on so you may have an, a, an announcement to make. Thank you very much. Yeah, sorry to, uh... Thanks very much to Daniel Kaufman and to all the panelists uh, and, and to yourselves. I, I'm sorry to, to wrap what was possibly the most exciting and, and engaging conversation I've ever heard about uh, evaluation and, uh, and, and that I, uh, and so, and good, congratulations. The bar was very low. <laughs> Not at all, uh, and, and so thanks to all the panels and thanks to you all as well. I think it's been a very exciting day, not only because of the launch of Open Government Partnership, which I think uh, show, uh, gives us, uh, there are a lot of people have been working for for quite some time, but because of the, the event that we had here today and the opportunity uh, for you all to share your inspiring stories and knowledge about how Open Government Projects can really transform the way that societies work and in the, in the relationship between government and its citizens. Well, today was the beginning of something that uh, has taken a, a year to put together, the work is just beginning. And, and as you go forward, I do encourage you to really look to each other uh, as, it not, as a community. They look at open government partnership, not just as a set of principles, but as a, a, a family that you can look to as you go forward. And so uh, continue to watch this space. One place that you can do that is in the, on the website, which is opengovpartnership.org. Uh, and so again, thank you again.